Well, good morning, Crossroads family. Welcome to online worship with us this morning. As most of you know, my name is Kristen Brown, and I'm the Director of Youth Ministries here at Crossroads. Today marks the first Sunday of the month, which means that it's Prayer Force Sunday. So I just want to encourage all of our Prayer Force leaders to hopefully be able to reach out to your Prayer Force partner either sometime today or later this week. We've been meeting as a youth group via Zoom, and while it's been challenging and fun, I'm definitely ready to see everyone face to face again, hopefully sometime soon. Psalm 91 is one of those psalms that's been giving me life over these last few weeks, and you may come up, have come across it too. But I just wanted to do our call to worship from um, something that's based on Psalm 91. Let we who live with faith in God proclaim, Lord, you are my refuge and my fortress. My God, I will trust forever. Let we who trust in the Lord know that holy love surrounds us. God's protection will follow us throughout our days. When we call out to the Lord, we know that we are heard. God is with us in every trial and temptation. Therefore, we will rejoice in the salvation of the Almighty. Amen. Let's pray together. God of great gifts, we give you thanks for the gift of your Son, who is in every way like us. We who are chained to the cycle of life and death found freedom in this child who is our Savior, Emmanuel, God with us. Be with us today as we listen, as we sing, as we pray. Fill us with your spirit, giving light in our dark places. Amen. Will you please join Graham as he leads us in a time of worship together this morning? Down your life. 
scripture reading from Philippians 2, 5 onwards. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of mankind. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. How great is our God. Thanks, Graham. Uh, will you join me in prayer? O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. What is man that you are mindful of him? Even in the midst of difficulty, we marvel at your goodness and your greatness for the absence of virus in our church community, for healing and recovery for William DeYoung and others in the Crossroads family, for the kindnesses that Crossroads community shares with each other as well as their neighbors for our small groups who hold each other up, for our prayer net and the prayers offered, for pending graduations and other milestones. Lord, we thank you for all these good things. And yet we confess that we so often dwell on the trifles, our own grievances, the speck in our neighbor's eye. Lord, cast us not away from your presence, but instead continue to renew a right spirit in us. We lift up the ongoing needs of our church family for those who have not experienced the healing they long for or that they see others enjoying. For those who grapple with the effects of aging, their own or their loved ones. Lord, we lift up our leaders, particularly in this season of operating without a full-time pastor and the ability to gather in person together. Be especially with Pastor Core, who leads us in this season and our pastor candidates, Jeff Kempton and Ryan Hall. Thank you for those who continue to share so generously financially and to help us, be, help us to be good stewards as we consider a new annual budget. May your hand be upon our voting and lots as we prepare for a group of new council members. Lord, we also lift up our community, state, and nation as we navigate this virus outbreak. We pray for safekeeping for those who are required to go to work or choose to go, and for your grace and provision for those who are confined. We pray for wisdom for decision makers, from parents to presidents. But even more, Lord, we pray that you will continue to remind us that our value and security come not primarily from the things of this world, but from our identity as your children, ones whom you love and to whom you have promised a sure hope. It's in this understanding and hope that we pray to you today. Amen. At this point, we would ordinarily uh, dismiss the kids to trails and uh, introduce the offering. And I want to uh, take that occasion a minute to thank you again for your uh, faithful um, giving. Um, we continue to be blessed by your uh, financial support, and we pray that you'll continue to do that, even though it's uh, not a normal giving pattern. Uh, whether you give through Easy Tithe or mail in a check, we certainly appreciate uh, your continued financial support. And now I'd like to turn it over to Pastor Cor, uh, who will open God's Word and lead us again. Good morning, Crossroads. Hope you all had a good week. We're in a, a new month, We're still under gathering restrictions, so I trust God will bless us as we worship Him together from wherever you might be watching this service today. We're continuing our series today on the I Am sayings of Jesus found in John's Gospel. And this morning, we will look at John 10, verse 1 through 10. The scripture and sermon points will be on the screen, but feel free to use your Bibles and follow along as I read. I tell you the truth, said Jesus, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. 
The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your holy word. We ask for a fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit so that we may have a heart of understanding this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We are surrounded by gates. Some of us live in gated communities. You may be, you have gates that let you into your backyard or if you have a swimming pool, you have gates around your swimming pool that let you into the swimming pool. Whenever we go to airports, we enter in and go out of gates. And in order to get to those gates, we've got to go through security gates. Some banks have gates that you got to go through to get in. Major League uh, Baseball and football games, you got to walk through a security gate to watch the game. Or if you go to amusement parks like SeaWorld or Disneyland, you have to go through a security gate to get in. So we're surrounded by gates. And in his conversation with his disciples and the Jewish religious leaders in this passage of scripture, Jesus identifies himself as the gate, or some translations use the, the door. Jesus' uh, words to them and us uh, give us an insight into who he is and also how we can grow into a deeper relationship with him. We believe in him as our Savior and Lord. Let me give you a little bit of background to uh, this story. In Jesus' day, uh, sheep were kept in two different ways and taken care of in two different ways. The first was in cities and villages. And usually there was a large holding corral where shepherds would bring their flocks at night so that they could be taken care of. And the pen was large enough to hold lots of flocks. And there was a, a security guard or a watchman or porter that would sit by the gate and let the sheep in. And also then again in the morning, let the shepherds in to gather their sheep. And so when the shepherds came in the morning, he'd let the shepherds in, they would call their sheep and uh, they would hear his voice and they would follow their shepherd into green pastures. A second way in which sheep were kept and taken care of were in the countryside by shepherds in countrysides. They did not have holding pens or corrals for the sheep. So what the shepherd would do is find a, a, a hole inside of a, a pile of rocks. And then at night, what he would do is, uh, since there was no gate, just an opening, the shepherd would lay across the opening to keep the sheep safe and to keep the wild animals out. So literally, he would become the door or the gate for the sheep. I believe that Jesus refers to both of these in this text for two distinct reasons. The first, Jesus was trying to help his people understand the false teachings and expose the false teachings of the Pharisees. And secondly, he is introducing himself as the truth of God. In the first part of this chapter, the first six verses, Jesus speaking of the communal pen, that large holding pen, where shepherds were allowed entrance by permission from the porter. He's trying to help people understand that the Pharisees weren't really their shepherds, but false teachers. Jesus was trying to get people to understand that only shepherds like him, who took good care of their sheep and, and uh, took care of them like Jesus did, were the true spiritual shepherds. And so he introduces himself as the gate. I am the gate, he says. I am the door. 
He is the door to a better life. He is the gate to eternal security. He is the gate to a more abundant life. Think of what he promises. Salvation, security, and satisfaction. First of all, he is the gate of salvation. Look at verse 7. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. So Jesus identifies himself as the only hope for salvation and eternal life. He is the only entrance for the sheep. Jesus is the door through which we enter the kingdom of God, and he's also the door through which our souls are released from captivity. All kinds of happenings can shut doors for us in life. Failures and disappointments, maybe wrong decisions that we've made or tragedies in life, sometimes doors to life seem so closed. But even through those hap kinds of happenings, God so often opens other doors of opportunity that lead to unexpected opportunities. However, nothing shuts doors so swiftly and so conclusively as sin. Every evil choice slams doors to find opportunities. When evil becomes a habit, we find our world closed against us, just like uh, closed shutters on a window. And within our own nature, sometimes uh, the door of spiritual hope, the doors of spiritual hope are so shut because we do not allow the Holy Spirit to take control of our lives. And shut within the prison of our sinful nature, what can we do? It's like the age-old question, can a leopard change his spots, or can a person begin again when he has grown old in sin? Putting the question that way reminds us of the story earlier in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, where Jesus is talking to an old man by the name of Nicodemus, who asked that very same question. Outwardly, he was not a man bound in sin, but he was bound all the same. He was bound to uh, his past of Judaism. He was bound to an old, disappointing order with a legalistic mind. He had no confidence in new truth. He had no place for uh, new young, young new prophets. He had no, no anticipation of new experiences and grown old and disappointment. He felt it impossible to change. He felt it impossible to go back and start again. And Jesus simply said to him, what you need is to be born again. Precisely that, to be born from above, to begin on a new level with new resources and a new life, to start fresh in the kingdom, not of the flesh, but of the Holy Spirit. Christ Jesus opened a door to Nicodemus, the door to new life. And you know what? That same promise he gives us. Jesus opens the door to new life for us too. Life is never hopeless without Christ. If any person comes to Christ, to be in Christ, the Bible says, he, is a, he or she is a new creation. Whenever sin slams doors shut, then Jesus opens new ones to all who are truly repentant. If we confess our sins before God, he's going to open new, new doors of opportunity for us. So Jesus is the door to new life. He is the gate to new life. He is the gate of salvation. Here's how someone explained it from the perspective of a sheep farmer. Any sheep, if treated with kindness and affection, soon attaches itself to its new owner. Sheep are a remarkably responsive animals for the most part to the attention and care given to them by a good shepherd. This is especially true in a small flock where the shepherd can give a lot of individual attention to his sheep. They quickly become his friends. Some of them even become his pets. They follow him as faithfully as his own shadow. Wherever he goes, they go with him. They are there. And it's in his company, in his presence, that they feel most secure and at rest. Well, I believe it's the same in our relationship with Jesus. We can enter into a new life with him, whereby we enjoy the safety and assurance and security of his peace and presence every day. 
this new this is the new life that Jesus offers to you and me. All roads do not lead to heaven, as some would have us believe. It's a very common thinking today. That there's many different ways to get to heaven. Christianity is one way. The Muslims offer another way. The Buddhists offer a different way. The Hindus offer another way. However, Jesus strikes down any such thought here and makes it very clear that he is the only one, he is the only gate into the sheep pen. He is the only one. He is the gate, the only gate, and that gate is Jesus himself. He is the only way to heaven, as the Bible says. And he proved that by dying on the cross of Calvary for our sins, by rising again the third day from the grave to give us victory over sin and death and hell that we celebrated on Easter. Right now he's, he, uh, he's in heaven where he ascended, sitting at God's right hand, interceding for us, and preparing a place for us if we believe in him. And someday the Bible says he's going to come back and take us to be with him if we believe in him as our Savior. So he is the gate to salvation. He also promises here in our passage that he is the gate of security. Please look at verse 9. Here's another promise he says. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. One commentator says, the sheep got their only sense of protection and security from knowing that the gate was there and that, and from the watchman at the gate, at the entrance of the gate. They knew they were safe as long as the gate was there. This was the only way in, this was the only way out. And all those in history who have promised eternal life through any other way except through Jesus Christ are thieves and robbers, the Bible says. And this is still true today of anyone or any religion who promises the same to you and me. The only safe way is Jesus Christ, the true gate. The gate gives great freedom. This gate gives great freedom to go in to find security, to go out to find pasture. It's kind of like that with the sheep. You know, there is both security and provision for the sheep that use the gate. By night, the gate is the entrance to a safe place. By day, the gate is the entrance to green pastures. And Christ is the means to both for us. The security, the sense that I am kept safe by Jesus, but he's also the means to having our souls fed through our daily bread, through those green pastures that he provides for a sheep daily. Later on in the chapter, in verses 27 to 20, 29, he talks about the eternal security that is ours through Jesus. Where the Bible says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they, they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. God wants you and me to know that I am his child and I am in his care. That you are his child and you are in his care. Both here and now and in the life hereafter. He is the gate of eternal security. The final promise that he makes is that he is the gate of satisfaction. Look with me uh, at verse 10 where he says that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So what kind of life does Jesus introduce us to? Verse 10, he says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus is the true shepherd of God's fold of sheep. He alone can open the door to let people in, or to cast them out. He is himself the door or the gate, and if anyone enters the fold in any other way, Jesus says, he is a thief and a robber. He is a hypocrite. But those who enter by Jesus, the door or the gate, find what they seek and what, they sh what shall certainly be theirs. 
Abundant life, as some translations say it, or a life to the full. You know, the very nature and character of God, made real to us in Christ, convinces us beyond any doubt, or at least should convince us beyond any doubt, that he literally pours himself out on our behalf. All of the external, the eternal ongoing activities and the energetic enterprises of God have been designed so that we might share and enjoy his abundant life. The simple truth, my friends, is this, that the abundant dynamic life of God can be ours continuously every day. It's not something that's handed out in, in neat little packages as we pray for it sporadically. A person has the life of God to the extent that he or she has God. We have the peace of God to the extent that we experience the presence of Christ. We enjoy the joy of the Lord to the extent and the degree to which we're filled with the, with the Holy Spirit of God. We express the love of God to the measure that we allow ourselves to be filled by God himself. You know, God is not way out there somewhere distant and aloof. No, he is here. He is present with us daily in our heart and in our lives every day. And in him we live and move and have our being, the Bible says. So the vitality of our spirit the energy of our emotions, the drive of our disposition, the powerful potential of our mind, the vigor of our bodies. In fact, every facet of our total abundant life is a reflection of his life being lived in us and through us every day. You know, the, uh, the difference between life and abundant life it's kind of like the difference between a baby chick with a flicker of life inside of an eggshell and that same baby chick which uh, begins to peek itself out of that shell and then finally breathes outside air, now free to grow and expand. That's the kind of gate that Christ Jesus opens to us when he offers us abundant life. To be a Christian is one thing. To be a believer and a follower of Jesus is one thing. But to have Christ in us in abundance is so much more. To have that abundant life, that, 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 that life that Jesus promises to the full is so much more. And I believe that we as Christians should never settle for the half-blessed life. God invites us to move on in and experience Jesus Christ in all his fullness. He is the door to a better life. He is the gate to a better life. He is the gate of satisfaction. Jesus promises abundant life. He promises life to the full. In conclusion, let me say this. If the temperature outside is frigid and cold, and if someone is in danger of freezing, then we need to do something more than just know where the door is, where the door to warmth is. We need to enter that door. Or say, for example, if a storm cloud is coming up and there's a, a great threat of a downpour of rain, then we need to do something more than just know where the door is, where our safety is. We need to enter that door. And in the same way, Christ comes to us and declares that he is the door that he is the gate to all that is finest and best in life, and that he is the only doorway to God. The risen Lord Jesus Christ, who is the gate or door to a better life, comes to the door of your heart and my heart today. He wants to come in and occupy the deepest core of our being. And as we let him come in. He becomes the, the doorway, the gate, the entrance through which we enter into the fullness of joy and into the very life of God. To him be all the glory. Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me 
will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for showing us again this morning that you are the gate, that you are the door, that you are the gate of salvation, that you are the only way for us to be saved. You died on the cross for us. You rose again the third day to give us victory, O oh God. And we thank you for that. Thank you for showing us again this morning that you are the gate of security, that in you we find our rest and peace and security every day, our assurance every day. Thank you for showing us again this morning that you are the gate of satisfaction, that in you we can find the fullness of life and you have so much more for us, O oh God, that we may experience that every day. Thank you for that abundant life, full of joy, full of love, full of peace, and full of blessings both now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. week. And now, my friends, go in his name, with his love, with his peace, and with his blessing. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week.